so my name is John Linden. I'm with Mythical Games. Uh, I don't really talk much about our company in the presentation, so I guess I'll give a quick introduction. So I was formerly a studio head at Activision, so I ran one of the game studios, mostly Call of Duty. Um, at Activision, we also do Skylanders. We put together a new company, mostly of game veterans. Uh, we have two other studio heads actually at the company. We have a former studio head of Oculus, uh, Facebook, who's now our COO. And we have a, a, a gentleman named uh, Jamie Jackson, who's a, he was another studio head at Activision, doing mostly a guitar hero and DJ. He created DJ Hero. So um, what I want to talk about today is just kind of what we're seeing between blockchain games and kind of games in general using blockchain tech. So um, I think I'll start off with uh, that first year in iPhone apps. It seems like forever ago. It was 10 years ago. But uh, does anybody remember what the first or the most downloaded game or downloaded app, I'm sorry, in the App Store was in 2018 or 2008? Anybody? Yeah. It was life-changing, by the way. What was it? I can't hear you. No, it's not flight control. It was, uh, it was. It was more important than flight control, I think. It was. Uh, sorry. Oh, what am I doing here? Still not working. There we go. It was iPint. The uh, I don't know if you guys remember this one. You could pretend you were drinking a pint of beer. This was game changing for the iPhone. So this was the very first. Uh, this is the most downloaded app in the first year. So that was that was kind of interesting information I found. I still can't get this thing to work here. Where am I aiming, John? There we go. Also, same thing. What was the most downloaded iPhone utility app? Oh, it's not iFart. Was it? it was not. It was not. <laughs> Luckily, thank God. Thank God it was not that. It was. Man. <laughs> There we go. It was uh, the flashlight, right? So, so the point of this was, even in the first year of the iPhone, we were still trying to fill in gaps. You know, you would never build a flashlight app these days, right? Because it's all there. So, so that was kind of the first year of iPhone. It was very, very fascinating that that's what came out in the first year. And in fact, um, man, I'm sorry, but I'm having issues with this thing here. So if you looked at the, the, the first 10 years, there's an article about 10 years later, basically none of the top apps in 2008 were even around anymore, or really even used. So that was kind of an interesting piece on, on where we've gone. So if you look at, look at mobile games, they didn't really happen overnight, right? So these are, to me, I think these are some of the more iconic games that came, came about for, for mobile. And actually, the, the first one I found was, was Doodle Jump. And if you look at that, um, yeah, just hit, I'll just I'll just cue and hit. So uh, it, it didn't come out for two years. So two years uh, before Doodle Jump hit the market. After that, Temple Run I think was probably one of the more iconic games, kind of early on. And you kind of can, to me when I think of Temple Run, I think of early iPhone days, right? But it was uh, four years. Uh, the next Titans that kind of came along was Clash of Clans and Candy Crush. They were five years later. Um, so one more. Uh, Contest of Champions, which is a staple, you know, still in the top ten. I think that was seven years. And Pokemon Go, which obviously is one of the fastest growing games of all time, was not nine years after the iPhone came out, right? So, so time's kind of on our hand right now, I think, in this industry. We're kind of a year in, and, and you know, that's kind of, kind of where we're at right now. And mobile took a while to get to where it got to. So we go to the next slide here. So... I do think it's really fascinating in the first 12 months. There's some things that are working really well with blockchain games. I think things that, that all games can kind of learn from. So the first one is uh, basically these new digital models, or new models around digital ownership, right? So what CryptoKitties did, the fact they did this is just mind-blowing. Um, now, obviously, it's a different time. People are throwing money around. But still, think about that, $115,000 for a 2D image. I mean, that's the amount of, the, that was just amazing. So, so I do think there's some amazing new models that are being proven out almost daily uh, with blockchain games, and I think this is really fascinating, right? So the next one, I think, is, is obviously strong pre-sales. Uh, pre-sales are important for developers. You know, Kickstarter's there, Fig's out there. I think this model is working quite well, and I think it's because of this, right? It's because of the concept of digital ownership that you can get these kind of pre-sales really cranking. All right, and one more. I think there's been some talk about this too, but incredibly, incredibly strong kind of ARPUs, right? The numbers I've seen so far, EOS Knights has been doing really well. It's a small game, but it's, you know, it's been doing between 2 to $6 a day per user, which is fascinating. Like mobile games and even PC games would, would kill for these type of numbers. Uh, CryptoKitties, which is now unfortunately down into a few hundred people a day, but it's doing $18 a day now per user, which is just, just remarkable, right? So I think these are, these are some things we've already seen that are really, really powerful. Next one here. So if we're building, why aren't they coming, right? The one, the one caveat to that is we're still in the single thousands or the low thousands of, of users, right? Well, the, I mean, really, it becomes down to this. Crypto, cryptocurrency is incredibly, incredibly difficult for consumers. It's probably even a little difficult for people in here. I have problems with some of those things. If you look at the first one, it's, uh, oh, 
More? There we go. Creating accounts. Private keys. Private keys suck. I mean, I'm sorry, but it's just a pain in the ass to deal with. You can't write them down. You can't put them in your email because somebody could steal them. You're supposed to write. I mean, it's just a real pain in the ass. But but this is a problem. And again, it's it's very very hard to to deal with. But it's it's this is challenging still. The next one is around uh, kind of funding accounts. So I, I tried to go recently and put put a bunch more money into crypto. I went through Coinbase, which is supposed to be the most consumer friendly. I put $1,000 a day for my bank account, which got there. Then they held my money for 22 days, which is <laughs> like, it's just tough, right? It's tough to get money into these things to, to buy this. So I think there's challenges here. The next one, uh, transferring between wallets. This is probably my absolute favorite so far. Who's, held, who's transferred money between wallets and literally held their breath for like three and a half minutes, hoping the money shows up? And, and I, yeah, I can even go to like Etherscan or Blocks.io or whatever and kind of watch it. The, the average consumer is not going to do that. You should send that money off and it doesn't show up, they're done, right? They're not going to try, try a second time. So I think that's a really big problem. And the last one, which is the one I, I, I still get so much heartburn over is signing transactions, you know, paying these transaction fees to the, at the consumer level. So imagine if, if any e-commerce site that used AWS, right? Anybody that used AWS, every time a consumer added something to their cart, it popped up and said, are you sure you want to do this? And that's going to cost you five cents, <laughs> right? Uh, e-commerce would be dead. I mean, it wouldn't be around, right? So, so I think we have to, have to deal with this. I think there's some chains that are doing a great job letting the apps kind of pay for this on behalf of the users. And I think that's just critical for, for kind of mainstream success. So, so um, I think there are some amazing things that are happening. And I do think, with the pun intended, obviously, the blockchain tech can be game changing. So not necessarily just the blockchain games and games built on, on the currency, but if you think about the technology, I think it is, it is game changing. But I think we need to be focused on the evolution and not a revolution, right? First of all, gaming's not really broken. The industry is not really broken, it's growing, right? So we have to think about concepts that will evolve gaming and make it kind of an evolution for consumers rather than disrupt it and we're going to reinvent it from scratch, right? Because I, I think that's a, that's a problem. So I think we need to be thinking about real games and things you can do that make sense to consumers that use blockchain tech. And to me, that's, that's a really important piece. The next one. I, this is one of what, like, I think is really fascinating is almost every genre of game can use blockchain tech in some way, right? And, and that's the, the one I, I, I had a talk maybe six months ago, and I'm like, except for single player games, right, or narrative games. And I think we've even heard some concepts now that are fascinating there. I mean, what if a single player game, <laughs> you're playing by, you're playing a Zelda type game, and the first person that gets to that item, it now switches items for everybody else, right? So it's still a single player game, but there's some cool concepts there. Verified ownership, who got there first? Who got there second? What's the first million people that got to that asset, right? So there's some really cool stuff you can do across almost every game genre. All right. Um, this is a big one to me. Uh, decentralization cannot be the unique aspect about the game because consumers don't really care. I mean, to be real honest, I don't want to like burst any bubbles, but they just don't care about decentralization right now. Now, I'm not saying they won't in five years. In 10 years, decentralization becomes more important. But right now, the, the average consumer doesn't care if your game is centralized or decentralized. They just want to have fun. They want to live in these worlds. They want to be immersed in your content, right? So I think if your game, if your unique aspect is, yeah, but we're decentralized, you're not going to get traction because it just doesn't matter to, to the average consumer. <laughs> and this is another one. Uh, any game, any app, right, has bad game loops, has bad UX, or has a bad game economy will fail, and blockchain is not going to fix that, right? So you have to make sure your game has a great loop, it has a great economic structure, it has great incentives back to the players, and it's very easy for people to understand and play that game. Because if not, you don't really stand a chance just because it has blockchain in it, right? Same thing as with regular gaming. All right. <laughs> so, uh, games incorporating some of these new concepts. We can hit the next one. So again, we've kind of kind of hit this, and I don't want to spend time on what everybody else is talking about, but this is a game changer to me, true digital ownership. Uh, the example I like to use is I've, I've, we did a game earlier, or no, so I guess it's the next year. Last year we did a game called Marvel Strike Force when I was at Seismic Games, and uh, you know, the game did really well. I think we did about 175 million last year off that game in mobile. Um, I kind of understand what free-to-play games mean and what you're buying. You're really buying personal satisfaction. You're not really buying anything beyond that, right? And personal satisfaction is great, but that's kind of what you're buying, right? So, so I, I kind of understand these economics. You all spend 20, 30 bucks on a game, kind of with that understanding in mind. And then freaking CryptoKitties comes out. 
And I suddenly dropped like 400 bucks. And, and it really, it, it was a big moment for me saying, why did I just do that, right? And, and it was confusing. I was very confused that day. <laughs> but uh, um, so I dropped like $400 on CryptoKitties. And the reason was that psych the psychology changes, right? You have the ability, you don't necessarily have to have buyer's remorse, right? You're not going to be like, if I buy these shards for Spider-Man, it's gone and my money's gone forever. They could be worth value, right? I'm not saying it will be worth value, but it could be. And that, that, that change and shift in psychology, I think, is really, really, really important. And access to secondary markets, I think, is, is great. I think you have to design it in that perspective. But I think the opportunity to have a secondary market is really, really fascinating. Um. Um, so verified events, quest leaderboards, uh, I think this is really fun too. Um, so having something, I think especially if you think about esports and things like that, having that out there, having it proven. When we were on Call of Duty, people would verify everything. I mean, they would they would look up everyday detail. They would argue over who had a head kill first or hit, uh, kill, you know, headshot first. Uh, it was just you know having a way for for the for the core hardcore gamers to easily go back and say, hey, we're not telling you, it's it's out there. So go check it out yourself. I think it has, it has a lot of impact on our games. Um, engaging pre-sales. I, th I love this one. Um, I think this is really fascinating to where if you did a Kickstarter and you're, and you're spending money in a pre-sale, um, that's exciting. But if you can actually start trading those assets and there's almost an economy that happens before the game comes out, that's really fascinating, right? And you can start building these player communities before your game even ever comes out. And I think that's, that's a big one that they, that's having this, they all kind of tie together, obviously. Having that true, true digital ownership kind of fuels the ability to do that and have an economy before the game comes out. So I think this is great, especially for indies. I think this is a way to continue to fund fund games and, and get people excited about your game. <laughs> and overall, uh, token economics are fascinating. I still think we're in kind of that 0.1% of uh, where we're heading. Um, but I think things like staking, staking is a really interesting concept, mining, obviously mining for play, things like that. Stable coins with dividends, I think you're going to see a lot more of this, you know, to where if you get in early, you can make some money later. There's just a lot of, I don't want to go into specifics around this, but, but I think the token economics are fascinating. There are things you can't do with fiat currency as easily, or it feels gimmicky. You know, if you suddenly said, hey, uh, if you take, I'm going to give you a dollar, and if you take 80 cents of that and put it over here, we're going to give you more stuff later. I mean, people wouldn't get, go for that, right? But with tokens, it, it's a little bit easier mindset because there is kind of this separation from real hard assets or real hard currency into this kind of virtual economy, right? So I think these are really fascinating pieces. Let's go one more slide. So trends that we're seeing right now. So I'm going to go through some, I, I said the good and the bad, but they're, they're not bad, they're concerning, right? So we'll start off with the concerning ones. To me, this is kind of the two worlds we're, we're, we're playing in right now. So this is kind of more kind of the blockchain games as we've seen it to where everything is built on crypto, everything is written to the blockchain, and what we're seeing is more games that use blockchain technology to, to engage the users, right? So we'll go to the first one here. Sin in the way. But I, I, this is kind of a bold statement, but I think blockchain games as we see it today it will remain a niche audience. It's not going to become a mainstream play. I just don't. And, and the reason is, is because it's kind of limited to either traders or it's limited to blockchain enthusiasts. So I think that's, that's one thing we have to be careful. It's not dead, but it will be a niche audience, right? Okay, next. Um, so blockchains and games can create value. Again, I've kind of mentioned this one before. This is really critical. Uh, there's a lot of value in blockchain. It's not just decentralization, right? I think that's, that's you have to be able to do more things than that. And the third on the concerning trends is it... I will say, uh, you hit one more. Okay, it's just it takes time. Time, like I said, back to the back to the mobile slides before some of these great games that you think were early iPhone games took literally years, and we're just not there yet. So I think it takes a little time, and, and I think that's not necessarily again, it's not bad. It's just we can't expect too much quite yet. So let's go more of the positives ones. This one I think is phenomenal. Blockchain is isn't just a new consumer platform, right? So in the past when we saw shifts in gaming, it was okay, mobile took off, right? But it's a very specific platform that you had to design against, right? Or or you know, switches now and switches here and switches this hybrid console mobile, right? So you have to design for that. What I think is really fascinating is the technology shifts that works across any platform over time, right? I'll say over time, caveat a little bit. You do have to deal with the Apples and Googles and the Microsofts, but I do think the blockchain technology will work across all games and all platforms over time, and that's that's really really exciting for the industry. One more. Um, again, I think we can we can look at you know it can create amazing value. I think this is one thing we kind of forget about on the blockchain side of things is you still have to look at regular game trends, right? You will be competing with everyone else over time, right? It doesn't make you different because you have blockchain in there. It, you 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 want to capture consumer audiences. You want to capture mass markets. This is actually a game we looked at for a while. A game we were starting to prototype a cool space game, but if you start thinking about it, space is kind of done right now, right? Ubisoft I think has a game. Bethesda has a game. Uh, Star Citizen will someday actually come. 
come out. Um, and, and it's just, it's a, so we kind of bailed on this, not because of blockchain or nothing, we, we couldn't pull it off, but because it's just a crowded field in general and, and you wanna be able to play in the normal game market, right? Not just block, uh, blockchain. And the last one, which I'm most excited about, obviously, is that, um, you put it up, just basically uh, what we've accomplished so far, um, what we've moved, I think we're moving faster than any other platform or, or shift I've seen so far, and I'm really excited to see what the next 12 months are going to be. I think we're going to see some really amazing projects this year that will start really solidifying a lot of these concepts we have. So next slide. I did have to put up one. We are working very actively on these theories, so I'm not just up here talking about things I think are cool. We're actually very much working on all these. We have a first game called Blancos. You're welcome to sign up for Blancos.com. I had to put a little shameless plug in there. Um, next slide, one more slide. Okay, that's actually the end of my talk. So if you have any questions, comments, threats, I take threats as well, uh, whatever you guys wanna, wanna go through. Yes. Can you wait for the microphone, please, Marie? And can you say who you are for the record? Thank you. Hello, I'm Marie from uh, B2Expand. We develop uh, blockchain games yeah, uh, based in France. Uh, could you tell us more about uh, Blanco's uh, gameplay, or is it, I mean, whatever you can um, tell us? At I've gotten that question a few times. Uh, we're not quite sharing it yet. Um, what I will say, we're, we're calling it a party MMO. So it's, a, it's, it's kind of a, we're kind of trying to coin this new term, party MMO, which to us is basically a place the players can be creative, they can be competitive, and it's nonviolent. So that's kind of the first game. I, I can't really share too much yet. We have a we have a announcement coming out um, before too long to show some of that gameplay for the first time. So. Um, yes, hi. Yes. This is Shirley, Shirley Ling of Doggy. Um, what about your go-to-market strategy? Where are you going to find your mass of users? Yeah, so uh, so we're actually taking again. We're taking a little bit more of a traditional path. So so we uh, you know we dropped our trailer on Gamer Choice Awards on CBS in the United States. We had a couple million people see it already. We've had you know that's resulted in, in a pretty big pre-sale sign-up already, which we're excited about. Um, we're actually going, and it's not really the topic of this conversation. We're going heavily after content creators. Um, I think con content creators, so brands, content creators, uh, YouTube influencers, things like that. And that to me, that I'm doing another. Another talk, if you guys will see, on player-owned economies upstairs, um, and, and I go a little bit more into that. But there's some really fascinating ways with blockchain tech and with smart contracts and things like that to bring in a new genre of marketing partners, right? If you give them an ability to, to make money in the game long term, you suddenly change the dynamics a little bit of what's in gaming right now. So we're going very heavily around that. You'll see some announcements on that as well soon. Yeah, so. the rates yeah. Yeah. Uh, again, our, our game is in fiat currency. It's not it's not built on cryptocurrency, right? Assets are written to the chain, but our game's in currency, right? So we we're playing through the normal marketing channels, right? We're we're really trying not to feel like a blockchain game. Like I said, that's the, the we're trying to be a game that uses blockchain concepts to do something cool, you know, and do something different. And so we're really playing in the in the traditional game channels. Okay, we've got a question right at the back. Can you just can you wait for the microphone to come, please? That's okay. No, no, we need to because we're recording it. So we, yeah. Uh, Serge Metal in Block One. Uh, so, do you see the future with uh, public networks for gaming or private networks and implementation for those? Yeah. So we're. Uh, it's interesting that you brought that up. Uh, yeah. So we're actually we're going to be writing. So our, our our view right now is that not everything needs to be written to the chain. In fact, very little needs to be written to the chain. So so we kind of view ourselves as gaming first, blockchain second. So what we're doing is we're actually working. Uh, uh, with with EOS uh, currently on on writing all the records of ownership to the chain. So those are the really things that need to matter. If you want to exchange an item from one to another, whether it's a character, a game master, or whatever is important, uh, we're, we are writing that to the public chain. We are not using any side chains right now. We're not using any private chains. We're going. We're writing right to the main the main net. Right. 